Welcome to Living with Reality, a podcast featuring archive teachings and modern conversations with Dr. Robert Svoboda, brought to you by the Be Here Now Network. Living with Reality explores Ayurveda and other wisdom traditions of India, which Dr. Svoboda has been studying for nearly 50 years. For more information, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Dr. Svoboda. That's D-R-S-V-O-B-O-D-A. Hello and welcome to Living with Reality. I'm Paula Crossfield, your host and Dr. Svoboda's media manager. On this episode, Dr. Svoboda talks all about the guru. He talks about his own teachers, what you do if you don't have a guru, and so much more. And this is in celebration of Guru Purnima, which is happening this month on the 23rd in the U.S. If you would like, you could join us live on the 23rd for a special episode of Storytime. And it will be focused on Dattatreya, who he talks a bit about in this episode. If you'd like to learn more about that, you can go to Dr. Svoboda's social media on Instagram at Dr. Robert Svoboda. Or you can go to his Facebook page and learn more, and it will be available for free to anyone who wants to join. We hope you enjoy. During 2021, Guru Purnima falls on the 23rd of July. Guru Purnima means the full moon day and night that is dedicated to the Guru. In Sanskrit, the word Guru is often derived. In Sanskrit, people always like to derive things. You get an idea of why the word means what it means. So, guru is often derived as gum rauvati iti guruhu. The guru is that individual who removes your darkness, who creates clarity for you. And that's certainly a very valid and valuable way to look at the guru. My mentor, Vimalananda, used to say that his preferred way to derive it was gunatita, urupatita, iti guru. The guru is that which or who is beyond all characteristics, all qualities, all attributes, that's guna, and beyond all rupa, rupa means form. So no characteristics, no forms, therefore the true real guru is the supreme reality of awareness that has no limitations whatsoever. And For you as an individual, your guru will be that individual, might be a human, might be an ethereal being, might be something else that connects you to that supreme reality, through whom that supreme reality comes and and generates a connection to you. Vimalananda would use the word via media, that, that, that being through whom that connection occurs is the guru. So the guru is at the same time an individual through whom this connection occurs, And the guru is that supreme reality that you are connecting to. It's also good to remember that the word guru in Sanskrit literally means heavy. So, a guru is also a heavy weight. 
Not, which doesn't mean that the guru has eaten too many sweets and become very fat, though sometimes that might be the case. What it means instead is that the guru is so experienced and so knowledgeable that that individual is able to provide wise counsel in any aspect of life. Even more to the point is that as a disciple starts to become more spiritually advanced, and that word spirit, of course, is something that is very different from matter. Matter is very solid, very slow moving, very difficult to change. Spirit is much, much more refined than is matter. And so as a disciple moves in the direction of spirit, it is, of course, a very transformative experience. And it is quite easy as you are starting to become more rarefied, more refined, more subtle, less dense and gross, that there may be some challenges remaining stable. So, yes, you're, you're bringing lots of extra shakti, lots of prana into your system. You're gaining an understanding of many, many things in many different realms of existence. And this can be unbalancing. It can cause disturbances to your awareness, your mind, your way of structuring your own personality and the way that you understand the manifested reality that we're all living through. It can also disturb your body by disturbing vata, the, the dosha, the, the principle of disturbance that is the undesirable form of prana. So what the guru does is act literally as a heavy weight. The guru acts as ballast, just as when you go up in a balloon, you need to have ballast in order to be able to bring the balloon back down to earth if that becomes necessary. And also to keep the basket of the balloon stable so that something untoward will not happen up there as you were moving around in those air currents. So in some ways, the most important aspect of the guru is to provide stability, to provide weightiness, to provide a sense of solidity, even though it's just a sense, even though it is it is a, the quality of st- solidity. So even if the guru is beyond qualities, in fact, one, the very fact that the guru is beyond qualities makes it possible for the guru often to deliver whatever qualities the disciple requires, even though, or perhaps because, the guru is beyond qualities, the guru is able to assist the disciple to obtain those qualities, those qualities that are necessary during this transitional period so that the disciple can remain stable while he or she opens their awareness to that reality. Guru Purnima is the day on which all gurus should be worshipped. If you have a personal guru, then of course it's that guru who should be worshipped. And guru is both an absolute and a relative term. There is your own personal most important guru, sometimes called your diksha guru. Diksha means initiation, the person who initiates you, who makes that first connection for you to reality. That's your diksha guru. But you may have quite, uh, you may have other shiksha gurus. Shiksha means 
performing practice, attempting to achieve something. So a shiksha guru is someone who might teach you dance or music or writing or sculpture. Anyone who who is who is or medicine for that matter. Anyone who takes you and puts you on the path of any form of learning is also your guru. So your supreme guru will be your diksha guru, that guru who connects you directly to that reality. But you have many other gurus, all of whom deserve to be respected, especially on Guru Purnima. For example, I regard Mr. Munthi, who lived in Toronto for many years, as my Jyotish Guru. He was not my Diksha Guru, he did not initiate me, but he certainly, it was through his understanding of and through his ability to manifest the Jyotir Vidya, the, the cosmic principle that, manifest, that has manifested in, in India as Jyotisha, as the Indian science of divination, his ability to transmit that knowledge and my good fortune in being able to be one of the recipients of that knowledge, both directly from him and indirectly from many of his students, including Hart Defoe, that makes it incumbent on me always to bow down to Mantriji as the 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 fount of the spring of that knowledge whose waters have have nourished me in the concept in the context uh, of this subject in my own personal case in the context of a diksha guru i was very fortunate to have as a mentor shri vimalananda who made it very clear that he was not my direct personal guru. And I made it very clear to him that, and he assured me that I would meet that guru. And I assured him that until that time that I did, that I was going to regard him as my guru. He had more than one guru himself, one of whom I was privileged to meet at least once a year, sometimes twice, for t 10 years until he departed from his own body. And that was Jatal Sadhu Ramvishwambar Das, who lived for many decades in Simhachalam, a well-known temple of Varaha and Narasimha in eastern, southeastern India. And Vimalananda regarded him as his guru. We all called him Guru Maharaj, even though he was not our Diksha guru. In fact, a, a friend of Vimalananda once went to Guru Maharaj and said, I would like to become your disciple. And Guru Maharaj said, well, let's think about that, because if you become my disciple, and you do anything wrong, meaning whatever I tell you to do, you don't do it, or what I tell you not to do, you do it, then you will be guilty of guru droha, violation against the guru. And then that may not be good for you. And when Guru Maharaj said something might not be good for you, you paid close attention because he was well known for causing trouble for people. So Guru Maharaj, was a what was a, a very powerful sadhu he had done immense amounts of sadhana and he would give guidance to people 
but he would not initiate people. Vimalananda had initiated a couple of people in his life, but he found that they had performed Guru Droha, a couple of them. And so he thereafter refused to directly initiate people. Despite that, the what I have learned from Vimalananda is a tremendous amount. And it has been through him that I have been able to continue moving forward on my path through life. So he would not allow me to call him his guru. I insisted on calling him my mentor, and he was fine with that. So this is something also that I think is important to consider if, for example, you don't have a personal guru. If you have a personal guru, then Guru Purnima is exactly the proper time to worship that guru. And as Vimalananda used to say, it's it, that worship of the guru is done on Purnima, which is the full moon, because the full moon, the full moon, of course, is the, 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 one, the, the one day in the month when the moon is not in any way obstructed by the earth. The moon is able to express itself completely and totally and utterly. And when that happens, there is always, because the moon is in charge of moving the water around on the world, and in the world, that's why we have the tides. It's moving the water around in us in a, in a subtle way, and particularly moving around the subtle water, that is your emotions. That's also part of the water reality of your, watery reality of your life. So on Purnima, on any full moon, the, the, everyone's emotions are much heightened. Whether you can connect to those emotions or not connect to those emotions, that's going to depend on you. But those emotions are going to be heightened. And if someone is a good disciple, that disciple is going to show great love for the guru because that guru, your guru, is providing you something that no one else can provide to you. No one else can provide to you that direct connection to reality without which you are quite lost. You're going to continue to simply be born and die and be reborn and die trying to find your way, wandering through all of the complexities of the law of karma and the samsara, the ever-moving creation in which we all find ourselves right now. So the guru gives light to you, and it's that full moon light that, that ca should cause your heart to open so that you can connect fully, so that that download of awareness can be without any limitation of your own restrictions. That there's a Hindi word that comes from Sanskrit, sankocha, and you often hear it speak, spoken in Hindi. Someone says, someone invites you somewhere, and you say, well, I don't know, and, and they will say, sankocha matkuru. Don't narrow yourself down. Don't get constricted. Don't op be, be open. Commune with us. Connect. And, and that's what the guru is trying to do. The guru is trying to, because we're all, we're all narrowed. We're all, we're all constricted. We've been damaged by the world. We've been damaged by whoever it may have been. It may have been the parents or, or some other relatives, or it, it may have been neighbors, or it may have been enemies coming from far away and invading the country. It may have been uh, things that happened in the past that come up as we grow from the inside that even if we're in a wonderful condition may be making it difficult for us to 
appreciate that condition we're now in because we're still living in some kind of past that we've forgotten, but that is still affecting us. So what the guru is inviting us to do is to relax all of that and to have faith that there is a reality that we can connect to that will, as long as we continue to connect to it, provide us an avenue along which we can exit from our confusion. That's the gum, the darkness that the word guru represents, gum ravati. So the guru is taking us from, from being un, in the shadows of this forest, this, this forest canopy, rainforest canopy of of confusion being created by all of the karmas that we have performed in all of our previous lifetimes and in this lifetime and bringing us into a clearing where we can see that there is in fact light. We don't have to be under the canopy all the time and then connecting us directly to that light. So this is why it's Guru Purnima and not some other day in the lunar fortnight or the lunar month because that's the day when there should be the greatest connection, not only cognitively, but emotionally as well, between an individual and his or her guru. Now, of course, many people may not have a personal guru in this lifetime. And or, at the very least, may not have met a personal guru yet in this lifetime. If that is the case, it's good to remember that one of the greatest of gurus in Indian tradition, Guru Dattatreya, also did not have one personal guru. In fact, he had 24 gurus none of whom were aware they were teaching him. He paid attention to situations and permitted those situations to enlighten him as to their significance, which is really the superior way to learn from a guru. Many people think, oh, if I had a guru, all I would have to do is sit quietly and the guru would tell me what to do. And there are gurus like that. And there are conditions in which that may be a legitimate guru-disciple relationship. Very commonly, however, that sort of situation is one in which there are hidden agendas going on. Vimalananda, who was very fond of proverbs of all kinds, used to meet various people in Bombay who claimed to be gurus, very few of whom, if any, he was respectful of. Neem Karoli Baba, who of course was not in Bombay, he was very respectful of. He had heard of him and probably met on the astral plane. But other than that, he and, and of course the great gurus of the past in India like Ramakrishna, Paramahamsa, etc. But most of his contemporary guru type figures, he didn't have a whole lot of use for. Because, of course, his own gurus were so amazing and transcendent and also because they're to him at least, seemed to, to be a confusion about the nature of what it means to be a genuine guru. Because in his opinion, to simply stand up and announce to thousands of people that you're their guru, you have initiated them and they will all, you'll, they will all be taken care of, that wasn't so meaningful to him. As he pointed out, Jesus of Nazareth who, according to him, was an avatara of Maitreya Rishi, the same Rishi whose 
better known avatar is Krishna. According to Vimalananda, if Jesus of Nazareth, who was an avatar, Jesus Christ, had only 12 disciples, and he was an avatar, how many real disciples can someone who is not an avatar to have? Now, that's a good question, and, we, and maybe that is, is not the most accurate way to look at things, but he, Vimalananda, did mention to me a, a story, a story he told more than once in my presence, about a certain well-known South Indian Swami who had moved to Bombay and opened a center there. And one day he came to meet Vimalananda and, of course, was welcomed with all sorts of appropriate things that you use to welcome the guru when he comes to you. And he spoke with a certain amount of ahankara, of egoism, apparently. And at the very end, this guru said to Vimalananda, you should come and attend my discourses at the Oval Maidan. The Oval Maidan is a, a big empty space in South Bombay. I say it's almost kind of like a garden, except that it's, there's always lots of people in there. So it's an empty space where people can, it's, it's a park, sort of, kind of. But, I mean, it's a park in which sometimes they have thousands of people meeting and discourses happening or at least they did back then. And so he said, you should come to Oval Maidan and attend my discourses. You will be enlightened. And Vimalananda couldn't take it anymore, and he said, enlightened? And you're going to give discourses on the Bhagavad Gita and enlighten me? Here's the reality. Krishna, the Bhagavad Gita, is a discourse between Krishna and Arjuna. Krishna, of course, was an avatar. Arjuna was an extremely advanced sadhaka. He had been able to obtain divine weapons from Shiva. He had done, achieved all kinds of other things. And when Krishna displayed to him the universal form, it overwhelmed him. He said, uh, please return to your normal four-armed form. I can't take the universal form. It's too much for me. And then later on, Arjuna said, you know, now I've, now, now I, now I've got my nervous system in shape. Please show me the universal form again. Now I can deal with it. And Krishna said, sorry, that, was, that moment has passed now. So Vimalananda said to this guru, or this man who was claiming to be a guru, if Krishna could not enlighten Arjuna, how are you going to enlighten me? Now, that gentleman who claimed to be a guru had a moment in which his path through life forked. One fork was he could have acknowledged, OMG, this is actually true. I have been talking about the Gita, but, uh, but in fact, I am no more in a position to enlighten people through the Gita than was Krishna himself who spoke the Gita. And then he could have acknowledged that this was an appropriate way of looking at reality and perhaps let go at least of some of his egoism and that, and that sense of guruhood that sometimes comes from being inspired by or even under certain conditions possessed by that quality of guruhood, of guruta or gurutva. He could have done that. Instead of that, he simply reacted because of he was sankuchitha. He was constricted. He was tied down to his sense of self. And what he said was, tumnastikho, meaning you are an atheist, which, of course, was a, com <laughs> was a complete non sequitur, because if Vimalananda had been an atheist, then why would he be describing Krishna as an avatar? Anyway, 
the point is that that was one more not so genuine guru that Vimalananda met. In fact, one of the proverbs that he liked to repeat about this sort of situation, and Vimalananda was very blunt. He's back in, and we're talking in the 1970s. He used to say, and that was that was before India was developed economically and technologically as it is now. Uh, he used to say, you know, our biggest export to the West is gurus. Everybody who learns a little bit and isn't, would be no good as a guru here in India, we just export to the West and there they can confuse everybody with the little knowledge that they have. So he used to say, Lobhi guru or juta chela. Narakund me telam tela, which is, you know, as with most of these Hindi proverbs, sounds a lot better in Hindi than it does in English. But the point is, what it means is, a greedy guru and a juta literally means lying, false, but it means someone who is not completely sincere and an insincere disciple are both just dangling in the pit of hell. The pit of hell is samsara. They're just, they're just treading water in the manifested world. Because what happens when a guru or a guru figure or somebody claims to be a guru is greedy, they are willing to not maybe tell the disciple everything about what's wrong with the disciple, or maybe tell the disciple that this, there, there is something better with the disciple than there actually is because they want something from the disciple. So just because you don't have a personal guru doesn't mean that you are going to be lost. In fact, you may have been saved from the fate of being dragged by one of these fake gurus in the wrong direction. What you should do is be willing to wait until someone who can really connect you to reality comes along. And until that time, you should open yourself to the real guru, and that real guru is the supreme reality. You sh everything you should do, you should be saying, oh, Supreme Reality, I want to connect to you, and you seem to be over here right now and over there right now, and you should read. You should listen to anyone who claims to be a guru. Don't accept all their claims, but listen to what they have to say. There may be something in there that will speak to you and will assist you to proceed further on that path. Listen to what everything has to say, just like Guru Dattatreya. Listen to the world around you. Allow everything to come to you and, and evaluate everything in the context of what is causing you to become more aligned with reality, not what's going to uh, make you feel better about yourself, not what's going to make you feel like you've achieved more and pat you on the back and tell you how great you are but rather everything that causes you to become more and more open to reflecting that ultimate reality that is both the goal and the guru who will take you to that goal. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat Parabrahman, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Guru Om Tatsat